All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Prep for Impact. I'm your host, Matt Parrish. And uh, if you've been around the Special Forces community in the last 20, 25 years, uh, you've likely heard the name Mike Vitra. He's a phenomenal guy. Uh, we joke a little bit. He's famous or infamous, depending on uh, what rank you had uh, dealing with him. Uh, but he's, man, he's an awesome guy. And I was really excited to have Mike in here. Uh, he's got a story career. He was in the invasion of both uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And we talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I also started a kind of a new thing for Prep for Impact, uh, talking more about resiliency and evolution and sort of uh, partnership. Uh, and because my goal for this show is for us to be able to hear from people, get some of their wisdom and their perspective, and for all of us as listeners to be able to take some of those nuggets of wisdom and utilize them in our own life. And I think Mike told some phenomenal stories over the course of this episode uh, that are really impactful. One of the things I respect most about Mike is he was a died in the wool, born and bred warrior for years and years and years. And he had to realize and make uh, you know a shift in himself and evolve a little bit towards the end of his career so that as he jumped out into the non-military world, he kept some of the attributes uh, that had made him successful, uh, but he didn't remain sort of stuck in his old ways of, uh, you know, just only caring about uh, going to war and, and combat. And he's really uh, transitioned successfully. And I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from him and hearing his perspective. And uh, I'm really excited to bring you this episode of Prep for Impact, a Green Beret Foundation podcast. All right, hey everyone, welcome back to Prep for Impact. As you heard in the intro, got an amazing guest uh, this morning, Mikey V. Mike Vitra, thanks for uh, thanks for coming in, buddy. How you doing today? Man, thanks for having me, dude. I'm excited. Uh, all right, so your name is well known across the SF landscape, but let's say that's a double edged sword. I think. <laughs> famous or infamous, either right. way, right? Uh, but let's say I'm listening to this, I don't know who you are. Give me sort of the the broad overview of where you came from, what you did in your career, and then we'll start kind of digging into some of those things. Sure. Um, you know, just the run of the mill kid growing up just south of Boston. Um, you know, school wasn't really my thing. So yeah. at 17, I had my, uh, had my parents sign me into uh, the Army. Hell yeah. Couldn't even do it myself. Uh, I did about six months in the delayed entry program and then uh, headed down to Benning, right? Uh, you know, they got me pretty good. Uh, the recruiter told me there was one slot left for the 82nd Airborne Division. I was like, man, what are the odds? This is outstanding. I'll take it, right? Perfect timing. Uh, you know, get to 80, the 82nd, you realize there's, you know, there's 15,000 people there. And I'm like, son of a B. And they got me. <laughs> that, that lesson learned number one, right? Uh, then did a couple of years in the 82nd. Um, yeah. Was going to do four years and get out. Uh, I tried to re-enlist. And I was like, well, maybe let's try to go to Italy or Panama. I'll just go mm. to a different airborne unit. And um, they're like, no, the only thing you can get is uh, brag. Mm. So I was fixing to just get out. And uh, I will I will give this guy all the credit. A guy named Wayne Page came from 3rd Rage Battalion. Uh, I think he got in a little bit of trouble. So they, they asked him to leave kindly. Mm. Went to the 82nd. He had been there about six months. And he's like, this place sucks. He's like, why don't you just go take the... SFAS PT test with me tomorrow. I was like, Sah. whatever. Yeah. Went and go take it. Zero plan. <laughs> pass. Go to selection. Pass. And then here we are. And, you know, I did. Ended up doing twenty six rather yeah. than four. Yeah. Funny how that works sometimes. But uh, it was a great run. Did a couple years eighty second. Uh, went to the Q course. Eighteen Bravo. Mm -hmm. Uh. A long, you know, kind of funny story is um, I had to go see what did they call that stuff back in the day? BCEP, mm -hmm. right? I had to get yeah. my uh, GT score up. Yeah. So I got my GT score up to like 126. Yeah. So when I get there, they assign me 18 Delta. And obviously I go into full panic mode because I'm a knuckle dragger and I am not going to pass that. So uh, luckily. Well, and also it's like another six to eight um, to nine months of the course. Like, I know a lot of guys, uh, you know, I was kind of in that same boat when we were picking MOSs. I'm like, that sounds awesome. But, but <laughs> at the time, I was worried, as funny as it is, I've said it a couple of times on here, I was worried we were going to miss the war at that point. It was like, Afghanistan and Iraq are happening. Like, I got to get yeah. to the group. You yeah. know? It'll uh, be over, right? But yeah, like, crazy. Uh, luckily enough, uh, I knew a couple of people that 
told me to go talk to this one uh, female civilian down there at Swick, and yeah. I brought her some chocolates and a fl- some flowers. And uh, she's like, don't worry, darling. I'll take care of you. She's like, you're an infantry guy, huh? I was like, yes, ma'am. She's like, yeah. okay. But a week later, I got 18 Bravo orders, and then the rest is history. I right? went to third group, a yeah. couple little stints, uh, instructor time with the 18 Bravo committee. Yeah. I'm sure we'll dig into that in a little yeah. bit. Uh, then went back, team sergeant time, did that, and then uh, finished up. Did some first time time at mm-hmm. uh, at the Q course, and then ended up coming make, making the E nine list, and then coming down to uh, SOCOM, which yeah. blessing in disguise, right? No one ever wanted to come down there, especially me. But uh, looking back on everything, it was probably the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, for multiple reasons. Yeah, we'll get into. It. I, I we talked a little bit about you know about it before we hit record. Like that's one of those things. I feel the same way. Initially, I was excited because I came down here for a first earned job, and then when I stayed. I was like, ah, all right, you know, but ultimately, uh, you know, God's got a plan, puts you in the right spots, helps out for sure. It's, uh, I mean, some of it was, yeah. I came down here for Jay Sofsey, mm-hmm. and I spent, you know, I spent 20 mm-hmm. years at Bragg, so I didn't know nothing but Bragg. Mm-hmm. I came down here, and I was like, holy Jesus, <laughs> is this how some of the other parts of the military live? This is, wow. Right. I had no, honestly, I had lived a sheltered life. Right. Yeah. I had no clue. So, yeah, I was lucky because, uh, you know, obviously they moved seven of the group yeah. from Bragg to Eglin. And yeah. then I came from Eglin to McDill. And I was like, man, I spent over half of my 20 years on Air Force bases. And as we all know, Air Force bases, extremely quality of life, man. a lot nicer Way than, better. than uh, any Army base. 100%. Um, you know, you were. You were kind of right at the critical points at the beginning of GWAT, yeah. right? Um, you you know you talk about being in the 82nd, going to the Q course, and then you are right there yeah. as everything kicks off. Talk me through yeah. how that happened. Like, what was that time frame? That was before you had come back to SWIC, right? You yeah. get in and uh, basically had a chance to to go over uh, and put it on the line pretty quickly, right? Yeah, pretty quick. So. Um and I got to I got to third of the third and um, ninety and a end of ninety eight so mm-hmm. ninety eight ninety nine yeah, perfect um you know just did a couple trips to you know Kuwait and a couple things to Africa and stuff you know the mm-hmm. normal normal stuff and then um, we were actually on a trip uh, in Kuwait mm. uh, and then um, just just I had come back and I was taking a French test obviously right and then. Uh, <laughs> Which I'm, I'm pretty sure it went as well as the most of them did, which is probably a zero zero. Uh, but um, and then you know we took a break in between the uh, the listening and and talking, and you know we found you know they're like, hey, planes hit wow. Pentagon planes. So you were hit. doing a DLPT, DLPT when, yeah. when the planes hit. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and then literally, man, I'm trying to think. I think less than a month later, where you know they had moved, we had us and a handful of teams and some fifth group. AOB were in Kuwait, right? Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, everything kind of moved from there. And I think we ended up getting in there. Uh, we weren't uh, we weren't on the, you know, the initial guys out of mm-hmm. uh, K2, but we got in there like May is yeah. when we got in at May 01, yeah. something like that. So, um, it was, you know, or it was, 02, right? May uh, 02, yeah. 02, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so, gotcha. like, it's very, um, you know, at the time, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right? So, you know, like, yeah, the Q course tries to do their best and get you yeah. set up. And they do, like, listen, I was an instructor there, and yeah. they do they do the best they can, but nothing prepares you for walking into the unknown, right? You just don't know. Like, you hit the ground, and, um, you know, you like to think that, you know, you're in special forces, and you're going to have everything at your disposal. Well, not in 2002, you didn't. Yeah. You had what you had, and you what you did have was money, though, right? Yeah. And uh, money buys loyalty. And latitude. Yes. Yeah. Freedom. A, a yeah. ton of latitude where, um, and I think that's a big separator, right, mm-hmm. for, um, for experience as a young guy, for, for especially like myself, right, yeah. where um, I got a ton of experiences between all the trips to uh, Afghanistan in the beginning mm-hmm. and then Iraq for the initial invasion that, you know, you were on, you split up the teams like two people. You yeah. know, you and another E6, right? Yeah. And then, and you had like a hundred dudes and we're doing, you know, movement to contact where, you know, they're, they're moving a hundred guys, you're moving a yeah. hundred. Like it's, it's basic seven dash eight stuff. And, um, but they put a lot, they put a lot of responsibility on you and you're, you're out there just doing the best you can. Yeah. And it's, uh, but it is no question 
learning on the fly, on the job training, but just lives are at stake. Spec Ops Tools is a different breed of tool brand. They produce premium, innovative hand tools by leveraging the dynamic strengths of their veteran team and leadership. In addition to staffing vets, Spec Ops gives a part of every sale back to extremely worthy veteran service organizations. Producing elite tools is their business and supporting American service members is their passion. Go check out Spec Ops Tools today. Prep for Impact is proudly brought to you by the Green Beret Foundation. The Green Beret Foundation offers emergency, immediate, and ongoing support to all generations of U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers, their families, caregivers, and survivors. The foundation provides direct support and advocacy to over 3,000 families each year. The Green Beret Foundation is here to assist you whenever you need them. Learn more at GreenBeretFoundation.org. Big yeah. difference, right? So. Huge difference. I, I think to me that's one of the differentiators between sf and a lot of other tribes and a lot of other places in the military non-soft is you know now we've kind of gotten to the point you said it like yeah we didn't have everything we needed that that was the reason to send special forces at Correct. that point right yeah, it's like force multiplier hey for we've sure. got we've got a, a problem if you know i always say like if there was already an agreed upon solution like if we knew what the answer was you don't really need sf right, right? like if if we already know like hey we need step one two three four five six go execute it, you don't need us, yep. right? It's like, okay, send somebody over there, very deliberate, go go through that checklist, good to go, right? But, hey, I need somebody to go and split apart and take control of, you know, up to a battalion size yeah. of partner nation, underfunded, under, well, maybe not underfunded, we'll say. Uh, yeah, funded. Uh, yeah. Funded, but, uh, you know, under-equipped at times, and, uh, you know, but a lot of, a lot of latitude, uh, a lot of trust. Yeah that, hey, these guys are, are going to go and, and do the right thing. What do you, uh, you know, what do you remember, you know, like sort of story-wise as you get in in May, right? Again, we didn't know what we didn't know, sure. right? You don't know if this is like, hey, we're coming in there to finish this off. You don't know if this is the beginning of, you know, 20 years of both of us. Uh, right. You know, our whole career is pretty yeah. much still there. What do you remember of like crossing over and getting into that first kind of uh, foothold into Afghanistan? Oh, man, it was a lot. But, um, you know, you, you just kind of when we first got there, you know, obviously you heard the stories of some of the stuff that happened right off the bat. And, yeah. um, you know, everybody riding horses and, you mm -hmm. know, from guy from being from Massachusetts, he's not necessarily a horse <laughs> rider. OK, so those were situations I tried to keep myself away from. But um, but I, I mean, I remember like it, it at first it was it, it was unconventional, but it was almost it was pretty conventional as well, right? Yeah. Like you were, you were getting whatever vehicles you could, right? right? Yeah, I mean, and you were just moving in convoys with, you know, trying to get out to where you needed to go. We ended up going from Bagram out to coast, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, obviously at that time it was it was tiny. It was a mm -hmm. um, very small safe house there, right? W yeah. With one of our uh, you know agencies there, and mm -hmm. then. Um, you know, we had uh, there was two ODAs, and I think there was like a company from the 82nd there, like a there, yeah. like a Delta company with like toes and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so just a you know a lot of patrols, just linking up with like the guy's name was Pachacan, was mm -hmm. his name, right? Obviously, a huge warlord. You know, we you go sit down with him. The guy had stockpiles of weapons for days. Yeah. Uh, obviously, worked for us against the Soviets, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. Um, but also, you know, total scumbag, right? Yeah, so, yeah. uh, sure. long, long story short, you know, I don't, his lifespan didn't last that long afterwards, but, uh, yeah. just, just for me, it wasn't so much the, you know, the running patrols and, you know, getting into like firefights or anything like that. It was, it was more like learning the landscape, you mm -hmm. know, like you knew you couldn't trust them, but you had to trust them enough, yeah. right? Cause without them, you're, yeah. you're not staying alive. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not going to happen. I mean, Maybe physically, where like you can defend yourself in a firefight, but you can't you can't outsmart an IED. Yeah. Right. And you got to sleep sometime. That's a fact, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, so money paid paid a you know a huge dividend there, but like it was the it was it was the trust thing. You had to really figure out like, hey, yeah, this guy don't love us, but he needs us as much as we need him. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the people that worked underneath guys like him that you needed to be really be aware of because you know 
who knows they were really working for they were working for him because they he was paying him right but yeah. aq was out there and you know we were out there at the time and i don't know if you remember the guy uh i think it's uh it was chris spear was his name okay yeah. uh, out from the unit right mm -hmm. and uh you know he uh he ended up you know getting killed that mm -hmm. day and you know we were we were out there we had just like we were literally leaving uh mm -hmm. to, to head back to bargram when that firefight was going on and mm -hmm. it was you know it was, it was a mess you know yeah. and, and is uh, that the first guy you remember losing at that point because uh, i know that was like really the i remember the first time that like one of the guys in my unit a friend of mine yeah. all those things like those things are seared yeah. in your mind of like and I, and i didn't know him yeah. well but uh I, I knew i knew of him right, right. And like but yeah that was the first one right yeah. so um and i think all of those affect you differently mm -hmm. that was just the first one that you know was the first person that had like connective tissue to you whether right. like it used to be a third group and stuff yeah. like that it makes so it real you it, know? it does make yeah. it real and it also makes you kind of feel helpless like you're there you're loaded with guns you get all this stuff but like still can't do nothing mm -hmm. then you find out the person who killed him was like I think it was like a 10 year old kid right right who threw a grenade yeah. uh ended up killing killing him and then long story you know let, let's fast forward yeah 15 years or something that kid uh, was a dual citizen canadian afghan his dad was a big supporter of bin laden mm. so that's why i went back to coast and um i don't know if you remember this but a few years back the canadian because we they scooped him up that day mm -hmm. he obviously went to uh Gitmo, yeah probably got released yeah. probably a couple other places right yeah. and then uh but the canadian government just paid him millions hmm. of dollars millions hmm. yeah so like unfortunately you if you do this stuff long enough and you're lucky enough to you know to stay alive long enough you see some uh you see some disturbing trends politically right not i don't oh, really yeah. care about you know who's in charge democrat republican mm -hmm. you know i, I none of us fight wars for them right? right we we fight wars for the guys on your team right like because your life's in their hands right so you you care about that and mm -hmm. you care about you know little things too right like going out doing the mission and getting back for taco night right <laughs> that's, i mean yeah. that's kind of, you know the deal that's yeah, kind of how you live your life but that's yeah. how, that's how we compartmentalize though right yeah so but yeah that was the first one that was definitely um i mean it affected me but not as bad as maybe one we'll talk about later right yeah. where but like that was the one that made it real and each time something like that happens i mean i'll tell you like at least for me psychologically you change yeah each time you change a little yeah. bit more so that was that was definitely one where i really started to be like okay yeah like yeah we're at war but now you really you got to step up mm-hmm you got to step up your game. You got to be you got to be turned on all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, like you got to be prepared to do bad things to bad people, and and not feel bad about it. Yeah, because that to me that's the only way. This is me, and not mm -hmm. not everybody feels this way, but I think that's the only way you stay alive. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a lot of luck or skill, you know, I, I did a I did a couple trips over yeah. there, so <laughs> I was able to uh, I was able to walk out of there, you know, at least. At least with all my limbs you know yeah, what i mean yeah. so that's that's a win for me 100 percent. no it's a great point i mean I, I i similar experience when you hear about a guy get killed like that it punches through and makes it real but also makes you realize kind of to your point it's like doesn't matter how badass you are doesn't matter how great your training is sometimes no uh, one sees a 10 year old yeah. kid throwing a grenade over the wall right all it takes is one lucky yeah you know, one lucky shot one lucky uh they only gotta be grenade. lucky once exactly you gotta be lucky every time absolutely yeah so. it, it definitely changes your mindset of it uh before we jump into kind of your you know kind of resilient stories and some of these other things that we're going to get into i'm curious because you were at the beginning of iraq as well right yeah. um yep. differences uh you know it, it's I think from the outside, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, they're kind of the same thing. They have this like Aladdin, like Night and day, desert, yeah. you know, they're all just the same. And it's like, dude, it couldn't be further uh, different. But some some similarities, sure. like you said, like having to realize that my it's not a is someone good or bad binary. It's like everyone is partially both. And yeah. I've got to figure out who are my allies really think about it, you know. Yeah, you're that. So are we. You're that. Yeah, you so are right. One hundred percent. This episode is brought to you by Andy's Fund. 
The Master Sergeant Andrew Marcasano Suicide Prevention Fund supports the mental health care needs of Green Berets and their families not covered by military health care. GBF takes a holistic perspective, considering treatments and therapies that may address underlying concerns such as substance abuse, PTS, TBI, chronic pain, and more, which can contribute to suicidal ideation. The Green Beret Foundation aims to ensure every Green Beret and their family receives the necessary treatment and care, leaving no one behind. To learn more, visit greenberetfoundation.org slash andysfund. Spec Ops Tools has two missions, developing the highest performing hand tools available and supporting the men and women who serve our nation. They employ veterans, support veteran philanthropic events, and donate revenue from every sale to veteran service organizations that make a real impact. Go check out Spec Ops Tools today at specopstools.com. Yeah, so as you think about being, you know, and I know it's a different thing. You're now post-team sergeant, Mike, you know, at the end of your career, looking back at it, I remember my time as like a young E6, and it was as cut and dry, simple as you made it, right? So yeah. I go out, I do the job, I come back, we get food, we work out, I go out again, right? Yeah. But looking back now, what do you remember kind of between those two, between the Man. beginning of Iraq, beginning of Afghanistan? Um Similar in some ways, but man, really, really different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, you know, Af Afghanistan, like, everybody's just super motivated, obviously, for yeah. many reasons, right? Revenge, mm -hmm. right? And um, I'm one of those guys, like, I don't forget, yeah, right? I still sure. don't forget. Like, I'm not I'm not a forgive and forget guy. Yeah. No, I'll probably die of a heart attack just because I've been angry my whole life, but you know, it is what it is, right? I'm working, it's, I'm a work in progress. Let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. Aren't we um, all, brother, aren't we all? But, um, but you knew what you were getting into because it was going on a little bit, right? Yeah. It had been going on a couple months. Um, now, when Iraq kicked off, you know, again, we got lucky both times, third of the yeah. third. We got attached to fifth group mm -hmm. for, um, uh, for Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and then for, um, for Iraq, we could attach the 10th group, mm -hmm. right? So they're like, hey, we need uh, we need a battalion. Nice. So we got scooped up by 10th group. Um, you know, I was listening to you and General Tovo, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, like, they're like, hey, we're going to go to Turkey. I'm like, yeah. well, cool. All right, going to go to Turkey. We're flying <laughs> from Turkey. We're driving in, whatever. Yeah. Like, the plan changed every single day. How, how long were you home between the two? Like, if you went in May of 02... Oh man, yeah, it couldn't have been too long. Before. It wasn't too too yeah. long because <laughs> I mean, what what's that like? It was what March, yeah, oh, you March know? of '03. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you couldn't have been home yeah. for very long in between. Yeah, All right, but keep going. You and think you're going to Turkey? Yeah, I think yeah. you're going to Turkey, and you know, all palletized, ready to go, and they're like, "Man, just we're delayed a day. Yeah. Turkey's not letting us in now." And then uh, they're like, "All right, everybody go home tonight," and they got to call. We got to call the next day. Like, "All right, come in, pack a shit. We're uh, we're going to Romania." We're like, "Huh?" <laughs> where romania I'm like okay so you know fly over to romania um and just i'll never forget like you would think you know we're gonna invade and special forces and you're like the best of the best man right now we uh that we had a plane miami air that that's how we got to, to war right that's how yeah we got uh we overloaded miami air probably way too heavy we landed in like newfoundland ireland uh germany i mean we were so heavy we had to get fuel every five minutes it was just just a train wreck but get to uh get to romania and they i'll never forget this for the like rest of my life they put us up in this bright orange hotel called the pelican on the black sea nice. oh man again like you get all these guys or young kids now like man was they see all this stuff and they're like hey yeah. we we want to go sf yeah they don't see this stuff man yeah, this yeah. this was the keystone cops it really was so we're in these hotels you know we're like at night we're trying to zero our lasers because they're like oh the invasion's tomorrow yeah that's off because of weather invasions tomorrow it's just it's just a mess and then one night they're like uh, all right it's delayed but um we're gonna fly to uh jordan mm -hmm. and we're gonna fly in from jordan the next night so we're like cool so we're you know Bad news bear style. You're just carrying your stuff, going to the going to the combat talons. We're like, cool, get a cool guy ride. Mm -hmm. And we get there, and we're like, hey, how long is the ride to Jordan? The guy's like, this thing ain't going to Jordan. This thing's going to Basher. We're like, <laughs> where? And you see, uh, it was uh, Charlie Cleveland and uh, I forget this our major at the time, maybe Fitzgerald or something like that. They were giving us uh, Big Macs, cold Big Macs and cold French fries. I'm like, damn. 
that ain't a good sign, right? So we get those things, and a uh, couple teams jam onto those uh, talons that night. And uh, you probably heard of it. This ugly baby is mm-hmm. the name of it, right? So, um, man, it's like I kind of studied the route a little bit after the fact, like years after the fact. That, yeah. like, I honestly thought we flew over Turkey. I had no clue. We went all the way down and around and up. and Because uh, of airspace issues, right? Like we talked a little correct. bit with Tovo. Yeah. Turkey wouldn't let them fly through. So they had to go around to the because, south. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so all the planes got shot up that night. Yeah. Like, uh, one plane got shot up really bad. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it had to do it like yeah. had to limp back to Turkey or mm-hmm. something like that, if I remember correctly. And then uh, I remember ours like it was red inside the tube, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, next thing you know, like the red went out, and like you could see the crew chiefs looking out the back. You could see like one of the the engines mm-hmm. were like was flamed up, and it was, but no one really knew what was going on because you were flying nap of the earth the whole time, and it was. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a it was a interesting ride once you started getting yeah. taking flack you know what i mean like man those boys who uh who flew those those planes they did a hell of a job because like none of us really knew what was going on until we uh what i like to say crash landed on the the runway they they smashed the ground opened up the tailgates we had javelins on the tailgate and they mm-hmm. literally just cut the cut the straps and the things are rolling down the runway. I yeah. mean, it's literally we kick everything off, throw our rucks off because we just had rucks. That's it. Mm-hmm. We walked. We you know we we walked in with what we had in our backs, and then uh, that bird took off. And you know you had the, uh, the Kurds sitting there waiting waiting for us with some of the advanced force like ODA mm-hmm. guys and stuff that uh, I think Tovo kind of mentioned. And um, you know I can imagine being on the other side of that, the Kurds, right? Like. <laughs> these are the guys who are going to help us win this thing huh yeah this is this ought to be interesting but uh man they we loaded things up and um you know started jumped on back of trucks they had tanks all kinds of stuff and started hitting you know they said specifically you know we don't don't go to mosul hmm. well, where do they want to go Mm-hmm. Mosul, sure. So yeah. I, they're Kurds. That's a, that's the most strategic point <laughs> so in the like, north. Yeah. Hey, you can't go to Mosul. Roger that. We're going to Mosul. Yeah. Sure, sounds good. I'm Let's not go. driving the truck. Right, so exactly. I'm going I'm where a they're passenger. going. Yeah. So that was the thing. Like it was more, um, like it was definitely more conventional, right? Because yeah. you had like Kurd battalions or mm-hmm. you know um, Kandaks and stuff like that, where like they were they were like mechanized, mm-hmm. shoot, move, communicate. Uh, they knew everything along the green line where the, where they were staying, mm-hmm. all that stuff. So that was uh, that was that was pretty cool, right? Mm-hmm. And then, um, but there was definitely a lot of um, where in Afghanistan you definitely had more like medevac and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Even in the beginning, yeah, in the north, in the beginning of uh, during the invasion, we didn't have nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, we we were able to get some some aircraft off the um, uh, off carriers, and we had like Mm b-52s and i mean i don't know if you've ever dropped had ordnance drop from b-52 that's a terrifying sight when it looks like they're right above you yeah Yeah, and they're like yeah you know bombs away and you're like no no that's not good so i would much rather have a low fighter or a 10 that i see and i can see the ordnance yeah but uh, but i I was able to you know we were able to use kind of some of the things that we we did on the ground in afghanistan just more mm-hmm. so just like the experience right what yeah. worked there what didn't and then again it was the, it was the trust thing here but the trust thing here was different right mm. they afghanistan all the tribes hate each other mm-hmm. right every one of them hate each 100%. other until yeah. you give them something to galvanize against right yeah. here it was just kurds versus the iraqis mm-hmm. right and you know they were gassed mm-hmm. and man they got a lot of hate there so you're not going to hold those people back. They're yeah. going, right? So I love that. Yeah. And there was a lot more trust there, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought that was really cool. Like, they're like, no, we're going yeah. no matter what. And I was like, oh, man, this is legit. Let's go, yeah. right? Yeah, you and can then, come with if you want exactly. and help, but and, we're going. And yeah. uh, it, it was definitely, it, it was awesome, though. And then, you know, we did that. We were in and out of there pretty quick, though. It was like mm-hmm. maybe three, four months, you know yeah. what I mean? Because, man, they were gone. After a while, I mean, between yeah. between everything going on in the south and the north, we, we, I mean, we bombed the hell out of them up there, yeah. and um, man, there wasn't much left. There was, I do remember a couple of things where like we had a couple um, generals who wanted to, you know, they wanted to surrender, but they're like, hey man, I can't. Yeah. And you know, they're trying to tell him like, no, you need to. He's like, I can't. 
Yeah. And he's like, because they moved our families to Baghdad because mm-hmm. they knew we would if that happened. And, like, and he's like, I have to fight or they're just going to kill my family, right? So yeah. you got to respect that, man. 100%. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I can't hold that against anybody. That's, that's, a, that's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, yeah. but at the time, I didn't really care one way or the other. Yeah. Like, I, I understand this point of view, but... Yeah, job's gonna get done, right? It's so, all it's all in the look back, man. Um, but he understood yeah. that though, right? Yeah. Like, but that that's a lot of stuff. Like E sixes nowadays don't get to see, mm-hmm. right? Like you yeah. in the beginning of these conflicts, man. Like we were exposed to so much more than what some of the the folks get now, and like it's almost like they get cheated. Yeah, because I feel like that uh, man it gives you so much more experience, mm-hmm. a lot more perspective. Like, yeah. what you know, what is a at the time a lieutenant colonel Tovo or you know, what is he dealing with? Yeah, man, because you're so worried about hey, just ODA stuff, and you're like you don't give a shit about anything else, right? Mm-hmm. But but you kind of need to, yeah, right, because it makes you understand the whole plan a little bit better. I've talked about it before, man, but there's multiple times in my career, especially as a young dude, where I met another, you know, I met somebody who was either on the other side or sort of on the other side, as yeah. we talked uh, earlier, and having the realization that if we switch places and how we were born, we'd be fighting each other and I would be on his side and he'd no be on, question. you know, and, yeah. and you come to that realization of like, like that general, like, Hey man, I gotta respect it, dude. I'd be in the same boat if they had my wife and kids, and you know, I'm completely. Uh, like, all understand. right, I guess I'm gonna fight. You know, yeah. uh, it's pretty wild. It's also, you know, to go back to that flight in, you know, it's always crazy to be stuck and be, you know, whether Helpless. that's whether that's in a in a truck, in a in a helicopter, in yep. a plane. Like it's one of the worst things for us because if I'm out on the ground and I have like the ability to evade or maneuver yeah. or try it's to take cover, you. yeah, then it's like you. It, it sucks. Don't get me wrong. It's scary, but it is not the same as like when you feel like I, I can't do anything other than just hope I don't get hit. Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, they say, uh, you know, fear and courage are the same emotion. The difference is the action you take yeah. after it. Right. It is. Man. Well, well, when you're sitting there and you can't take that action, like, OK, I'm going to courageously sit here and hope I don't get hit. You know, it's like uh, it's one of the craziest the, things. I think the funny thing yeah. would have been that night is. I don't, none of us knew yeah. how dire the situation was because we couldn't see anything, right? So yeah. uh, if we knew, yeah. it would have been way worse. Yeah, 100%. I would have been way worse, man. There's, there's so many times like that where you look back and you're like, man, if I would have realized, oh. I would have been I would have been in a lot worse position. No question. Sometimes, sometimes the fog of war is a good thing because uh, it doesn't, sometimes you don't want to know everything yeah. that's going on or what you're up against. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty wild. Um you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned to you and, and for everybody listening, uh, changing up the format a little bit and going towards some kind of narrative based questions, uh, because I want to, you know, pull out some of the perspective and some of the resilience and some of the things that we can, uh, you know, all of us as listeners to, to your stories, things that we can, uh, you know, take and utilize in our own lives. And so the first one that I like to ask is, you know, as you think about kind of partnership across your life and across your career, you know, who were the best teammates or who was the best teammate that you ever worked with? And, and you're welcome to say his name or not say his name either way, but more importantly, like what attributes did he have or she have that you, we can take and emulate to be good teammates, whether it's in our in our jobs and our families, et cetera. Sure, uh, there's a, there's a couple, mm-hmm. right? Um, and different ranks and different reasons, sure. right? Um, one of them, I'll tell you right off the bat, was um, he was a company commander during um, during Afghanistan and then um, Iraq and stuff. A guy named Chris Riga. Yeah, uh, you know Chris. Yeah, so, yeah. so Chris. Uh, he's a, he's a Boston guy, yeah. right? So there's obviously always a, uh, a connection. There's there. a bunch of you guys that are good green bros. There, there. There's a bunch of mass holes yeah. out there, right? <laughs> uh, we're definitely a different breed, right? Yeah. You would think, uh, I mean, let's be real. It's one of the more liberal States in, yeah. in the union. And, uh, but it, it puts out some savages it for does, sure. Man. Right. Some and, hard uh, dudes for it, sure. But Chris, um, man, unwavering loyalty. Mm. I would say Chris's weakness kind of like my own is uh loyalty to Mm. a fault yeah right um man you knew even if you screwed up you're gonna pay the piper but you're gonna be all right you know what i mean and like uh just like there's maybe there's better more tactical and technically proficient 
commanders out there than him. Mm. But man, guys would guys would go through hell with gasoline pants on for that guy just yeah. because he had their back no matter what. Yeah. Right. And then like growing up where I came from, um, you know, keeping your mouth shut and just loyalty is a big thing. I would rather have a guy who um, is just staunchly loyal. I'll teach him the job. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but you can't teach loyalty. You can't yeah. teach trust. Right. And yeah. uh, and then, you know, during that time, during any time, mm -hmm. uh, like trust is imperative, man. Like yeah. you got to have that. So. Chris, Chris was huge for me for a, for a very long time. Even at, even even yeah. you know post post career, right? Still talk to Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I love him. And then uh, you know Dax Williams is mm -hmm. you know one of my best friends. I we, love Dax. We man. met literally day one of the Q course in 1998. You know, yeah. you got this white dude and this black dude, and we you know Williams Vitra. We were like the same, <laughs> right next to each other for the whole Q course. Then we go to third group together. None of us wanted to go to third group. We all wanted to go to seventh group. We got selected for third group. We were pissed. We were mad. Yeah. Showed up happy. We didn't care, yeah. man. But like, uh, you know, he's he's. I mean, he's legitimately my boy. Like we yeah. we were in third battalion together. Then we went to Swick together. And then we went back. Uh, we ended up down at you know yeah. in Tampa together. Yeah. And we still talk all the time. I was talking, yeah. you know, I talked to him yeah. yesterday. He was smashing me about the Patriots yeah. being just straight <laughs> trash, right? So, oh, um, Dax, if you're listening right now or you're watching, I'm coming for you. I want you in the oh, seat as man. well. I was lucky enough to. Uh, that guy is yeah, he's the a, funniest he son of a bitch hilarious. on the planet. I was lucky enough to go to Sephardic with Dax. Oh right? God, and yeah. I, he was so fun, man. He's just. I don't know if I've ever met a funnier dude, like off the cuff while you're just doing things. Dude. He just, you know, I talked about when I, when I was talking about doing this meme page and all that stuff, I talked about how like humor can just like change the ah. entire, it can change your, your day, your life, all these things. And Dax is one of those dudes that hundred percent, it doesn't matter what, how bad anything Dax is going to find a way to have something funny. And, you know, he's a hell of a Green Beret, yep. technically, tactically, yep. all these things. But, man, he's just the best dude to be around. Uh, he's, and, man, yeah. I, I love him to death. He's, he's my boy. Awesome, like, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, you know, wouldn't have been as successful as, as I was if it wasn't for him. I mean, he was at a different place than me and Swick at the time. Yeah. And I went and talked to Georgie Becker, who yeah. was another yeah. one of the guys that I like really looked up to. Yeah. And I told George, I was like, hey, this guy's down at Sop C. Yeah. We need him. Yeah. Why? We just need him. Yeah. And he's he just one him. of those dudes. And man. he we yeah. got him over to the 18 Bravo course. And like, that's the last thing we needed, but it was the best thing, right? So was he there for the eat a dick thing too? Uh no. Oh, he, he was, was not, after it. he came in after that. Like he was there when it when it came out. When it came out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he wasn't there during it. So it was uh but yeah, I mean man, Dax is awesome. He, Dax is for, for man, he's he's kept me he's kept me on the straight and narrow because yeah. the biggest one is and I loved him to death was a guy Paul Sweeney right okay. yeah. Paul, Paul got killed in yeah. um, you know 03 mm -hmm. and um, all right 03 yeah 2003 yeah it's been a minute so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all, literally yeah. the 30th of this month will be 20 the years he's yeah, been, yeah, yeah. yeah he's been gone so like and I mean I'll tell you like um, you know I like to talk about like resiliency to a lot mm -hmm. of guys like listen Man, when when Paul got killed, mm -hmm. that was um, that that changed me. Like, it just changed me. Like, I did not care about, I did not care about, like fighting, mm -hmm. dying. Um, you know, I didn't care about anything. Yeah. It, it turned it turned me into a different person, um, which I thought was great because mm -hmm. I completely compartmentalized everything, and then it turned turned you into rage, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I thought it was great for what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but in retrospect, it was, you know, it's tough on family. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you don't care mm -hmm. about anything. Like um, there was a time where people were just like, man, you can't, you can't say that to, yeah. you know, that rank per I, I just, I didn't yeah. care. What are they going to do? Yeah. I did. I didn't care. Yeah. And at the time, like I was good at what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so they, they probably tolerated me, but like, yeah. Um, I, I, I describe I it, it as great. like a fog. Like it, when it I look back, when I look back at like, I, there's a, you know, there's a compartmentalization that you do and 
it is, it does feel like a great thing yeah. when you're there. Like in, and in the old days where you just went over there and stayed over there, yeah, it probably was a great thing. And for us though, trying to come in and out of war and have that very sharp, I don't care if I live or die. Yeah. It's hard to come back to Fayetteville the, or Destin or wherever. The problem was it's very tough. coming back, right? Yeah, like, 100%. Because I didn't switch it off. I, yeah. I stayed it's, on. It's almost impossible to switch and, off right away. Um, yeah. Like, I just never switched it off. Yeah. And, like, it was um, it was definitely it was definitely bad personally, right? Yeah. But, like, but it makes you so much better when you're going on target and you, you don't care. Like, I I, don't, I I'm don't. going to make the mission... I don't, and I'm going to run through bullets. I don't, and I didn't. And, uh, you know, like, you know, I mean, I always get a little bit emotional talking about, about Paul, but like, uh, you know, all I, all I wanted to do was just, I wanted to kill as many guys as I could. Avenge his name. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like, um, I just, it just stuck with me for a long time. Mm -hmm. It took, it, it probably took me and you know, you never get over that. I mean, you, uh, you know the way you would i think the way we do move on is uh you know you just keep those guys alive mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. like um i've been wearing this bracelet for 20 yeah. years man right. like he was the best i've he was a yankees fan which disgusted <laughs> me he was a giants fan which disgusted me which means he probably had a low moral character right uh he used to tell me about shit like uh jersey tomatoes are the best tomatoes <laughs> have you ever heard of a fucking jersey Nobody, tomato nobody's going I mean, out of their way to get a jersey just tomato. stop right <laughs> But I mean, that like, you know, you remember stuff yeah. like that. And like to that, to this day, I still laugh about it, but he, yeah. that definitely, um, it made me a good, good at what I did on a team. Yeah. Uh, maybe not great as an instructor because you would still think, you know, yeah. but I wanted to prep these guys to go to war. Yeah. It's and critical. I didn't really care about some of their test scores. I just wanted them to be ready to go right yeah. when they got to a team. Yeah. And then, um, but the the big fight was, um, you know, when when I went to the academy and you had to come down to Tampa. Like yeah. you went from being a caged animal for, you know, whatever, fifteen years, yeah. and then you got to come down here and try to be, you know, normal. A very groomed yeah. animal, and, uh, uh, and yeah. that I am not. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a big. Uh, or lightning. I was not right. Yeah. So you uh, you mentioned resilience. Kind of the second question uh, is centered around resilience. And, you know, you've done um, so many different what the world considers hard things, right? When you look back at your own life, doesn't have to be professional, can be personal, can be whatever. What do you consider the hardest thing you've ever done? And what advice would you give me if I was trying to do the same thing? Mm. That's a really good question, man. <laughs> it's, it's a, there's a lot to pick from well, in your life. I mean, I, I kind of kind of dovetails into i got a really good friend from back home who um he's like hey can you talk to this kid for me it's Mm -hmm. a good friend a good friend of mine's son and he's in range regiment right Mm -hmm. now and he's trying to figure out what's he gonna do yeah and you know kids from massachusetts right so uh, i told him i was like give me my give my number man and and the kid called me and uh i just he's like you know i'm trying to figure out what i'm gonna do and you know what the future should look like and i was like well if I if I did it all over again, I'd be willing to take more chances early. Mm. I was like, if you're good at what you're doing now mm-hmm. in regiment, I was like, but you got a thousand other guys that are good like you. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, so how do you make yourself better, or mm-hmm. how do you separate yourself from your peers? Mm-hmm. Does that does that mean go do things like Red and I did at SOCOM? Right. Uh, does that mean like you find a path that's good for you? Because mm-hmm. if you separate yourself, you're already at, like, you know, you go SF, you're already in the top 1%. Mm-hmm. All right, well, how do you separate yourself again? You yeah. either go to, you know, go one, up, one of the sideways, selections. Yeah. Exactly right. So you got to figure out what you're going to do. And when you do that, I just told him, I was like, will you be more specialized? Yes. I was like, but then you're going to get in there and, it, you know, it's kind of it stove pipes your your promotions and stuff mm-hmm. like that but if you care about what you're doing mm-hmm. that's all gonna work itself out because if you yeah. if you're good at what you do you're you're gonna you're gonna make the rank like i was i was good at what i did uh i'm 88 early mm-hmm. i'm 89 early mm-hmm. um and like listen there's plenty of commanders out there that wrote my oers yeah that definitely did not like mike vitra 
right but they couldn't deny him it is yeah. what it is right yeah. like i will say one of my favorite group commanders was a guy named gus benton mm -hmm. all right and uh if you knew gus all right mm -hmm. gus and mike vitra were the 180 of each other but uh when i was a team sergeant and he was a siege of commander two trips in a row um you know when there was missions to be done inside of like northern kandahar tarankout kind of area mm -hmm. man they called and and we did it mm -hmm. and there was no questions asked you just go out and you do it and you come back and he liked results and mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't tell you how to get the results he just knew he wanted the result and i'll take care of everything else yeah and we did and i loved that yeah this episode is brought to you by the 1952 society by joining the 1952 Society, donors become a part of an exclusive group of Green Beret Foundation advocates dedicated to providing vital support and assistance through a tiered donation system. Donors can choose a level that reflects their generosity and receive exclusive benefits and recognition in return. Together, we can ensure that our U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers, their families, caregivers, and survivors receive the support they need when they need it most. Visit GreenBeretFoundation.org society to join the ranks. So unfortunately, within the Special Forces community, suicide has become an epidemic. And suicide prevention is something that we all want to take part in. And it's not just clicking through some slides uh, on a suicide prevention brief. The Green Beret Foundation stood up Andy's Fund directly to try to address some of the underlying concerns like chronic pain, TBI, PTSD, that previously weren't supported in suicide prevention programs. To learn more, please visit GreenBeretFoundation.org slash Andy's Fund. You don't always have to uh, love the outside dog Correct. to know that some tasks are, he's the best one for it. True. Right? True. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of commanders where they get, where they go astray is they don't set aside some of their personal feelings and realize the skill uh, sure. of some folks like that. It you happens. Know, it happens yeah. to everybody, man. hundred percent. You know, I think, uh, no, I think it's a great point as far as, you know, as you're trying to, figure out what to do find uh find ways to push yourself always right no the only question. way you're going to get better is to find new challenges find other people around you who are doing things and try to attain something else because if you remain like if you're the top of wherever you're at and you just remain there you've just capped yourself sure and you uh you lose the opportunity you know that kind of leads into the next one as far as you know our our evolution as men as people um you know I have a lot of times in my life where I look back and I'm like, man, I would never want to go through that situation again. But now in hindsight with wisdom, I look back and I'm like, man, that really made me who I am. It's something I'm thankful I went through. Don't put me back there. I don't want to have to go through it again, Yeah. but I'm really, uh, I'm thankful for it in the long run. You know, as you think about that, where, where in your life is there a situation where you're like, man, I'd never want to go back to that, but it definitely made me who I am, man. Like, um, well, I think there's two significant things out there is one when, when Paul Sweeney got killed, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, uh, I don't want anybody to ever, you know, I mean, guys do, right? Cause yeah. too many of us, too many of our friends and brothers and teammates been killed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you do this long enough and what, I, what is it? Section 68, right? Yeah. At, uh, Arlington, it's, it's, you know, you go in that place and it's full. I, it's yeah. yeah. And I know too many people there. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, 60, yeah, it's, 60, right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, dealing with that was bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, just, it's just kind of like, it made me really good at what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but like, um, it made everything else go in the back seat, right. Mm -hmm. Which, um, definitely should have been better about that. And then part two would be leaving that team environment right mm -hmm. um and coming down to socom mm -hmm. you know started it over there at the jog at um mm -hmm. at um Soxent. and um and they want you to like they expect you they and rightfully so they expect you to go from being a super high performer where you're at to just coming in here and hey man it's nine to five and you know uh you know, everybody's kind of relaxed yeah. and Fortune 500 kind of. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, was, I wasn't good with a lot of that stuff. Like, I wasn't good with, um, you know, people just doing, like, they'll get around to it when they get around to it. Mm -hmm. That shit don't fly with me, man. So, 
Uh, I had some issues when I first got here, right? Uh, there's no question. I did not like it at all. And um, I, I really hated a lot of the people around here just because um, I just I just don't like I don't like laziness. Yeah, complacency. Right? I don't yeah. I don't like it at all. Yeah. So um, but I did like that 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 was that was hard for me. That mm. transition was really hard. But um, one thing it did do between that job and then you know going over to SoCom mm -hmm. was uh, I mean like when I'm around you and team guys, mm -hmm. we're normal. Yeah. Right. We're normal because we all have the same issues. Right. But yeah. you but you think that's normal and then you get down here. Yeah. Or get you know get to SoCom or one of the big cocoms and. Uh, you're like, man, everybody around me is jacked up. Mm. And you, you say that a lot. Mm -hmm. Then you get it like, then you look around and you're like, hmm, maybe it is me. <laughs> maybe it's me. Right? <laughs> so yeah. like, uh, it, it definitely took some, uh, it took some coaxing from guys like Dax who like, mm -hmm. hey man, um, he was like, you know, maybe we should try to, you know, tweak the system a little bit yeah. here. And, uh, you know, you got to go, uh, you got to have a come to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. You got to be like, hey, man, am I going to ride or die this or am mm -hmm. I going to evolve yeah. and get better and be, you know, be value add everywhere I go, be value add now. And then, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on retirement. So, mm -hmm. man, I got to be value add to society. And if I walk out the gates today, mm -hmm. I'm not. Yeah. Right. You're, you're a break glass in case of war guy. Yeah. You got you got to. You got to reframe yourself, man. You got to turn around and go out and be like, okay, how, you know, how am I going to be value add to a company mm -hmm. that wants to hire me doing something and, you know, do something completely different, right? Not mm -hmm. the things that we've done for 20 years, yeah. but, you know, using a lot of those skills, but doing something completely different and then, you know, just reattacking that, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's, so that was, that was the best and worst part about coming down here, right? Like I wouldn't want to go through it again. Yeah. But it was essential. Like I had to do it, or uh, I would I wouldn't be where I'm at now. There's Man, no question. I, I love it because uh, you know, from the outside, if you look at your life and all the crazy things that you've been able to do from a civilian outside perspective, it's like this dude's done all these crazy hard things. He's in the invasion of both of these wars. He's going through all this crazy training, all this crazy combat. <laughs> the the evolution and hard part was trying to tweak that back into something where you could just use the attributes and not be right. that. And, uh, you know, I don't think most people would think of it that way, but I, I had the same experience where it was like, I called, uh, SOCOM like my halfway house in between the military and the That's civilian world analogy. because it was like, I came in and I was like, okay, this is very corporate. This is much different. Yep. And some of the ways that I led on a team as a team sergeant for three years was not going to work for the next three years at SOCOM. Yeah. Right. And, uh, it, uh, it definitely is an interesting movement, but what, what I really respect <clears throat> as we ran into each other was a six, eight months ago or whatever at an event. And I started hearing, like talking to you about what you're doing in transition, yeah. what you're doing now. I really respect the ability that, uh, you know, you finally had that kind of come to Jesus realization that mm -hmm. like, Hey, I love being Mike Vitra, the freaking warrior. Yeah. Right. And I'm not going to completely shelve that. I'm not just going to become like a you know, I'm not going to grind my canines down and become a leaf eater, but I've got to find a way to use those skills and those attributes to be able to move positively yeah. in the future. And ultimately now, uh, you know, incredibly successful using some of those attributes in the, in the civilian world or in the non-military world. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, the last kind of, uh, of these four questions is about purpose and that's a perfect kind of tie into it. You know, what's your next goal or your next ridge line that right now you're set as, hey, this is this is where I'm going. This is what I'm trying to push towards. Sure. Um, you know, first off, I think, um, you know, the whole transition thing is um, it's what you make of it. Right. Mm. Um, it's an individual know, sport. For it sure. is. Right. So SOCOM's got a whole bunch of programs. The DOD's got a whole bunch of programs. But the one I found the best was STAR. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, SOCOM's got it's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of, you know, this right local president CEOs yeah, yeah. and um, man, it, but it's what you make out of it. You know, you're not going to go in there and meet one of these guys and they're going to offer you a job for 250 K <laughs> ain't going to happen. But what I did is I wanted to go in there and absorb as much information from these folks as possible. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, these folks, are, I mean, one of the mentors was Jeff Vinnick, you know, yeah, the yeah, owner yeah. of the, uh, the lightning. Yeah. Right. And uh, 
I mean, these 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 are like super successful men and women, right? Mm-hmm. So I would go in there and just ask questions and be like, you know, if I could do X, Y, and Z, how would you let, how would you use me if I worked for you? Yeah. Right. If you're an investment banker, I'm not going to do that. But like, what could I do? Mm-hmm. So I would take those bits and pieces, right? And um, to me, it was no different than what we've really done our whole life. You're just mm-hmm. building relationships, yeah. right? That's that's our money maker. And uh, man, th- they those folks really took care of me. They mentored me a lot. Um, and then it's just, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I had a whole bunch of job offers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which was really good. And, and I really wanted to do something different. Mm-hmm. I felt for, uh, just for, just for my mental health, right? Mm-hmm. I needed, I needed to do something completely different than what mm-hmm. I had ever been associated with. So I was able, uh, I was offered a job at uh, TransUnion, mm-hmm. uh, the credit bureau, which, mm-hmm. uh, at first I was like, huh, man, <laughs> what am I going to do for them? Like, <laughs> how am I going to be a value add to a credit bureau? And, uh, it was just it's very, very, very fortunate for them to to seek me out. Uh, they kind of gave me the pitch. They're like, "Hey, we would like you to kind of uh, be a, a you know a sales representative for us. You know, kind of work in some of our um, you know government government uh, contracts." And so I was like, "Well, you know what? I need to do something new. Mm-hmm. It would still give me some type of safety blanket where I know the community and the customers." Sure. But I would have to learn data, mm-hmm. right? And as an 18 Bravo, 18 Fox, which doesn't mean a whole lot much more. Like, that's intimidating, man. 100%. Yeah. That is intimidating. But uh, I knew I needed something to light my fire every day, yeah. right? So, um, so you know, I accepted the job. Um, it was, man, I'll tell you what. They've been, it's been amazing for me. They've been you know, very supportive of anything I ever asked. I got mm-hmm. a service dog, you know, yeah. like he goes everywhere with me. Yeah. Um, that's never been an issue. I mean, great company. Mm-hmm. I mean, just really, really good. But I had to, uh, you know, I had to immerse myself in, you know, how how do I learn all this data? Mm-hmm. And then how, to, how do I parlay that over to my customers for what their mission sets are, right? Yeah. And, but I had to find that new, that new dopamine rush right Mm -hmm. and for me that was the deal of getting the customer their critical need which is it doesn't matter who it is doesn't matter Mm -hmm. if it's federal law enforcement or uh or the federal government the dod whoever right like i just needed to like what keeps you guys up at night what is your critical gap can we help you let me let me throw this at you. If not, mm-hmm. I'll find the people who can help you because because right. I'm still emotionally attached to those those type of customers because I understand the importance of their missions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, so I learned and continue to learn. I learn every single day there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's been it's been really, really, really good. It's just um, going to SOCOM mm-hmm. without question set me up for success. Right. Mm-hmm. You're at an enterprise level yep. command. Uh, dealing with, you know, general officers every mm-hmm. single day, um, which parlays right over to dealing with a CEO, mm-hmm. or president of U.S. markets, or anything like that. And, and you're seeing enterprise problems, abs- which are, which are different. Absolutely, yeah. right? So it just gives you, you look at it through a different lens. Mm-hmm. And even where I'm at now, I'm still a bit of, uh, a, say, a, a unicorn, right? Where mm-hmm. um, there's not too many Green Berets in the data world, Yeah. okay? So... Um, I look at it. I look at you know the the problem solving solution mm-hmm. different than a data scientist or a data engineer does. Sure. But when I look at it through my lens and they look at it through their lens, we put a solution together, right? So, but it's a it's a lens that they would never have if mm-hmm. I wasn't there, and vice versa, right? So, um, nothing we haven't done our whole life, right? Yeah. Collaborating with the subject matter ex- experts at your disposal using them effectively and getting you know meeting a mission you know mm-hmm. uh you know meeting deadlines meeting a mission whatever it may be and uh you know i just kind of turned that into my new cycle kind of thing yeah. right where um you know i don't both my kids are in college yeah. right uh i don't have kids at home you know uh my my girlfriend does very well which in her job so like i just work man yeah it keeps me busy and uh you know, sometimes it's just good to stay busy, right? Because mm-hmm. it keeps uh, keeps everything else 
in, in the closet, right? So yeah. like, uh, I mean, I love what I used to do, but I really do try to compartmentalize and, um, you know, never forget what you did, but just try to move on a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, I loved what I did. It was awesome. And, uh, but it's definitely, you know, it's, a, it's, time, it's time to build a new one, right? So mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to no, do. No, and that's why, you know, I love it because you said a lot of a, a lot of really wise things in that and, and showed them through your actions. You know, I think it was critical for you to, to do something different, to kind of have a demonstrable break in that as you were trying to sort of evolve and figure out how to how to change from being that breaking in, you know, break glass in case of war to like Mike, the Green Beret veteran who still a warrior if he needs it, but is not walking around all the time uh, yeah. at that. Yeah. But also what I loved about it is you talked about, okay, I got a foothold into this job and I dove completely in and learned everything I possibly could. Um, because you didn't, you didn't, you know, sometimes I think people are like, oh, well, I'm bringing all this military experience and leadership and whatever. And it's like, cool. That's a great add on, but, but you also need to be tactically yeah. proficient. It's the same yeah. thing when you made moves in your career, you didn't show up and say, well, I did all these things at other places. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to be me at the new places like, yeah, yeah, but learn the skills no uh, as well. I think the, the big thing, Matt is, uh, you know, being a, a seal or a green beret or whatever, mm -hmm. some of your pilot, whatever right. that gets you in the door some places, right? Mm -hmm. Then what? Mm -hmm. then you've got to be value add because they're taking a flyer on you, man. Yeah, 100%. They're like, hey, I'm going to go hire this former special forces guy yeah. who doesn't know anything about sales, who doesn't know anything about data. So basically he knows nothing about what I want to hire him for, yeah. except he knows the customers. Um, mm -hmm. So like, you don't, you, we inherently put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't want to let those people down, yeah. right? They, they, yeah. they put their reputation on the line to, to hire a guy that... Mm -hmm. Would if I put a resume in, I would never get, get picked up for that. They would, I would have never made it by the the first, you know, the first selection to yeah, the first HR, screening, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so to me, like I was like, I can't let these folks down, yeah. right? So, and um, and now I just I just keep that same thing going every day, right? And mm -hmm. just um, it's been it's been really good. I learn every single day. I learn business, which is cool, and uh, you know, we'll see how we'll see how far it goes. But right yeah. now, it's 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 a really good ride. They're good people. And uh, and they deal with me, right? Yeah. Which is not always the easiest thing to do, dude. I love it though because uh, you're no one. No one proves um, the transition story better to other businesses than a than a hire that they have that actually crushes it. Sure, right? And like yeah. you're re you're representing the community so well to TransUnion and other people that are in that sphere. To say like, hey, if you find the right guy at the right time, who's willing to come in sure. and learn it, uh, you know, it can be kind of rocket fuel, yep. right? And so, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. I think we touched about maybe 20%, 10% maybe yeah. of what we probably could have over the last hour. But man, I really appreciate it. It's been an awesome, uh, an awesome conversation. It's, I know that... Um, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit in the red episode, like you and I served together at SOCOM, but you never really get a chance to like sit down and be like, oh yeah. man, let's, let's, let's hear about like what's been going on in Mike's life. Yeah. It's like, we just kind of see each other. Yo, what's up? You know, we run into each other in airports and stuff, but it's great to be able to sit down and hear more, uh, you know, definitely got to have a Mike Vitra part two at some point in 2024 <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and tap into some of those more, some more of those things. But man, thanks for coming in, dude. Man, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, just, it's good to get. It's good to kind of talk about the past every once in a while, right? Yeah, man. It keeps keeps uh, keeps our brothers alive. It right? One million percent does. It's, yeah. good. it's good for the soul, man. A hundred percent. Well, I appreciate it, and I I appreciate all you out there for uh, listening or watching to another. For ugh. I appreciate you listening or watching another episode of Prep for Impact. Uh, we're excited to be able to bring you these every two weeks. Uh, if you want to help out the show, make sure that you go on whatever platform you're on right now, whether it's uh, you know Apple Podcasts, Spotify, if you're on YouTube, whatever it is, uh, go on, like the episode, comment, uh, share it, rate it. All those things help other people find it. Uh, you know, and if you found some portion or all of this episode to be as interesting as I did, uh, you know, hit the share button and either put it on your social media 
or send it to somebody that you think can uh, can get some value out of Mike's stories, out of his perspective and wisdom. And uh, you know, if you want to check us out, you can check us up uh, Prep for Impact Pod on uh, on any of the social medias. Uh, also, check out Spec Ops Tools, who you heard a couple of uh, ads for, as well as the Green Beret Foundation. And uh, down in the show notes, you can find links to all of that stuff. If you ever want uh, to give us an idea of someone you want to hear from, it's Prep for Impact uh, at gmail.com. And again, thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact, a podcast from the Green Beret Foundation. Thanks. Thanks for listening to another episode of Prep for Impact. Just as a reminder, everything you heard on this episode and every episode of Prep for Impact are just the opinions of the speakers, whether that's the host or the guest, and they're not the official position of either the Green Beret Foundation, their employers, the Department of Defense, or anyone else. And with that disclaimer in mind, I want to take a quick second to give you my opinion on the best way to prep for impact. Across my life, whether it was as a Green Beret or personally, I found no more secret weapon than to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my Savior, and to walk his path rather than mine. And so if you're curious about that, or if you ever want to talk, my DMs are always open. Thanks for listening to Prep for Impact.